Start. We are live. Three, two, one, go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode one of one zero three, one hundred and three. The end of the year for twenty fifteen. I mean, it's been. I don't want to say it's been a slow week, but it's not really anything earth shattering. PSN went down. Electronic Arts went down. But we knew this was going to happen. I mean, if you didn't know. All this stuff happens every year at the same time. Nothing that you really have to actually worry about. But there's been a lot of funny stories and little, little, little itty bitty things that Tom and I were conversing back and forth with. So I mean, let's just start. I mean, it's we we were already pre-show. We were talking for half an hour, and we could have just recorded and been our show. But let's actually have a show. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, around the holidays is always pretty slow. Um, you know, hardly anything has happened uh, except that uh, I guess Brian Krebs got his PayPal account socially engineered, which isn't too hard to do. What is hard to do is socially engineer the same account, the same person, twice within a couple hours. Well, you're really, burying the lead here. <laughs> really impressive. Don't let's uh, PayPal allowed an intruder to get into your account. That's not yeah. news. Yeah, that happens a lot. I mean, so if you don't know Brian Krebs, uh, he's an underground security researcher who we really, really, he finds good things. He may have broken the Ashley Madison story. He's fantastic. Year. So he goes around and he gets into the deep web and he acts like everybody else and he finds things. But somebody try, called PayPal, turns out it was an ISIS propagandist and hacked his account. But Brian Krebs is not stupid. He, he doesn't have an eight-character password. He has that. He has two-factor. He has all the security questions. So somebody didn't brute force the attack. They just asked. And if, apparently, if you ask, you shall receive. And that's what happened. I guess it was an early Christmas present. Yeah. I, I actually, uh, I want to say well, probably eight months ago uh, at uh, the Ohio InfoSec Forum. Um, that's a, a plug for you guys listening at home. Um I, I gave a talk on this that, you know, no matter what kind of operational security you have, right, you can have uh, a 200 character password, all randomized, the craziest level of security, only uploading encrypted files to Dropbox, uh, you know, and, and make sure everything's SSL and make sure you've got like a super patched up Linux machine running on the Tor network uh, through a VPN underground in your bunker with a single ethernet port because you don't trust wi-fi but if uh if the guy on the other end of the paypal support phone number uh is convinced that oh yeah this dude on the phone talking to me is totally that guy let me just reset the password for him you're you're still owned uh customer service you know I, I, as usual humans are the weakest point in any security infrastructure Right, computers are hard. People are easy. It's it's really hard to explain to someone why their password needs to be secure, and when they forget it, all these different things to get it back. People they forget their password. They want an email link saying, "Here's your password. Click on it." And even that, they don't want. They 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 just want it to work. I mean, they want a cookie implanted in their system that always logs them into Amazon. And if they have to type a password, it's the most obnoxious thing. And we saw that coincidentally with, I don't know if you're with Vista, the UAC, people got mad that UAC constantly badgered them and all they had to do is hit okay. And they didn't yeah. even want to do that. So, so any type of like re-verification is a royal pain and people don't want to lose business because of, oh, it's too secure. So they, they weigh the convenience factor. And unfortunately, like you said, when you have somebody on the other line that can reset it, you have a problem. Yeah, and, and really, you know, there's no there's no great way around this. Uh, unfortunately, you know, companies aren't going to pay to put security experts behind each and every customer service interaction, right? A security expert isn't going to pick up the phone the next time you call Amazon, no. Uh, you know, they're, they're people that in most support roles, most especially level one support roles, it doesn't pay very well. I've been there. I've done that. Um, <laughs> So you're not getting paid very much. You're probably not getting trained very much. Uh, in a lot of cases, you know, they hand you a binder and they say, hey, just follow the prompts on the flowchart and read what it says here. 
Uh, and, uh, if, you know, occasionally you'll get a new binder with a new flow chart because they have to change some wording or something. Uh, but it, you're, you're not a security expert. You're not trained. A lot of the times, you know, your identity verification tools are, uh, you know, either very poor or non-existent. Um, you know, you just have to kind of go on gut instinct that, oh, yeah, I totally think that this person owns this account. Let me reset it. And the person sitting in that chair on that phone call has all the power. Literally all of the power is being handed to someone making minimum wage or a little bit above uh, because that's all the companies can afford to do, right? If you had to pay someone, uh, you know, Brian Krebs level salary and say, hey, you are now customer support because you are in the highest privilege of any security individual here. So you're going to be taking phone calls all day. A, they're not going to be very happy. And B, you might be able to get one, maybe two support personnel. What if you're the size of PayPal? What if you have to have hundreds of these people, right? You simply can't afford it. The business would collapse. So I get it. There's not a great solution that I can see, though, other than better identity verification tooling and that's that's difficult to do well and the other, the other, not perfect and the other idea that you're making minimum wage or slightly more than that what do you what do you really care like honestly what do you really care you're yeah you'll get fired but then you'll just go to another minimum wage job and and go from there it, it's it's and i initially had an idea years ago and i don't know if we spoke about it but charge somebody let's say you forget your facebook account Charge them a dollar. Say, here's a dollar. And it what we'll do is it will prov- if you have to reset the account, here's a dollar. You have to pay it to get your account reset. And this is mainly for if you forget your password. Just basically saying, here, keep it secure because if you don't, it's going to cost you a dollar to reset to to get it to get it changed. And from there, you're going to make a, a conscious decision to say, hey, I really don't want to spend that dollar or five dollars or whatever else. But. Yeah, but there's there's an issue there, too. I mean, what do you do in the case of breaches where you have to send out the mass email? Hey, everyone, go and reset your password because uh, we've disabled everyone's accounts because we got owned. Oh. I mean, in, in that case, you know, there's there's special cases and it, it doesn't cost. You know, I, I know uh, I know people that work as pen testers and, you know, they don't think anything about going out and dropping you know, $15 on a domain and 10 bucks on an SSL cert at the very least, right, for uh, a phishing attack. Um, asking to pay a buck for a password reset, sure, you're going to get the bottom of the barrel. You're going to knock out, you know, the, uh, we'll say, we'll, we'll be generous and say that the bottom 75% of people that are just trying to, you know, jerk someone around. But I don't think you would really stop targeted attacks. You know, someone attacking Brian Krebs, it's not like he pulled a, an account out of the air. Uh, Krebs has a tendency, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, he, he's kind of cheered on for making people, uh, you know, criminals, uh, angry at him because he does a great job of exposing people. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think it would have saved Krebs. It's a decent idea. I definitely think we should uh, we should dive into that a little bit more. Well, the, the idea was... If, if you really, if you lost your password and you're really intrigued about getting it back, some sort of dollar amount would prevent the the people from spamming you and everything else. But yeah, let's, let's, let's move on because we can go over and over this forever. I mean, we can essentially go over this, but my question to you in relation to this <clears throat> is it sounds like you don't have to have a strong password. You don't have to have good security questions. You just have to socially engineer the person on the other side. So why do we, why do we need all these crazy long passwords if all you need to do is convince the other person that you're that person, you're Brian Krebs or whoever else? Right, right. And if, if you get that, you've got the keys to the castle. That's it. That's game over. So, so maybe that maybe it should change it. You need unique passwords. Length is always important, but at the end of the day, you're still you're still beholden to the server and the way they hash the codes and this, how they deal with their security questions and everything else. And right. while we're not saying not to have a password manager, we're just saying because you do want the unique passwords. It's it's you almost want to say who cares about the password length, which I know is wrong. It's wrong, 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 but. Okay. Yeah, just you know, it, it's it's one thing to to say, um, 
you know, that password length is everything, because it's not, it's not, right? Having the strongest password in the world doesn't help you if someone dumps the database of the website you were trying to log into and gets all of your credentials that way. Um, and it, it definitely doesn't help you in the cases like, you know, Amazon or PayPal, people that have a phone number that you can call and get your account reset. Uh, it, it doesn't help if you can convince someone, uh, you know, or someone else can convince them that they're you, right? Um, it's important, but it's, it's good to understand what type of environment you're trying to secure and what types of things you're pr being protected against, right? PayPal, I'm sure, <laughs> I really hope, uh, they're, they're hashing their passwords correctly with Bcrypt or another uh, cryptographically strong password storing hashing algorithm. Uh, but the easiest way in is gonna be through customer service. Uh, now, one thing to remember is in that event, let's say someone hacks your account, they spend a bunch of money. Um, hopefully PayPal can prove that it wasn't you and their fraud protection will kick in. You won't owe a dime. Well, I mean, and that's what, and this is yet another reason to have a PayPal account with no money in it. Put some token amount that if you buy something for small amounts, $25, $50. So if it disappears, you're not out a huge amount. And don't use it as a bank. Just if you have money in there, same with your Bitcoin wallet, take it out, put it somewhere else. Put it something with much more stronger protections. And I'm old fashioned, somebody I can talk, I can see face to face. So, yeah, I mean, that broke, that broke a couple of days ago. And it's just another black eye on PayPal and everything else. The next, yeah, the next story that, that we were talking about is, is I want to create a VPN at school or at my job. Uh, yes, I'm a programming teacher. And one of the tenants of the new AP course is security. And we were told that the, that the Wi-Fi network is insecure. So I thought it would be a great idea to, hey, have an after-school assignment, a club, whatever. Let's just make a whole bunch, take Raspberry Pis for $5 when we can get them and make VPN servers. Everyone can go home and just route their traffic. They learn how to create a VPN. They learn the Raspberry Pi. They learn hardware. They learn software. They learn Linux, which is completely probably foreign to them. And they're learning how IP works and the trace route works and what's going on, how to do a Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange, create a cert. Look at all these great things that you're learning that at any one point you can stop and chase the rabbit hole all, all the way down. And at the end, they're secure. Yeah, this, this sounds like a fantastic project because it, it's big enough to take a long time. Uh, yeah, I, I could definitely see this being done in like uh, an early college course, like a freshman college course of, uh, you know, operating systems or security where take your Pi. Uh, we're going to learn how to flash things with, you know, uh, the Windows image um tool, I forget what it's called, uh, or with uh, the disk utility on Mac OS X. Um, we're we're going to flash a Pi, you're going to boot it, you're going to learn some rudimentary Linux commands so you can get around the, the system, and then we're going to learn about OpenVPN. You know, you, you can take this and just stretch it and build on it, and you know, if they have OpenVPN, you can say, all right, we're going to make a loopback uh, bound Apache server. So you have to be logged in to your Pi to get to an own cloud server or whatever you wanted to to put up there. It just sounds fantastic. It, it, and it's and it's one of those things, could I get in trouble? I mean, who knows? But when you're being told that the Wi-Fi that you want your students to use or the students are being told that they have to use is insecure, it's it's starting to if you're a BYO if you're a bring your own device type uh, organization and your guest network is insecure the the network that you want the people to be using then you absolutely should have to put some some mechanism in place to protect at least your people and I feel like making a VPN will at least stop well keep them uh, as I want to call it secure the problem is that we can't track the students which is our job but. I don't know. I, I think security is a little more important. I, I think really, you know, the the learning opportunity is going to be the the thing that's paramount here. And and if you're taking, you know, a pie from nothing and uh, building it into an open VPN box, yeah, yeah, I, I think there's a whole lot to learn there, and a whole lot you can take away and uh, you know use on a job market through on a resume. 
I wonder, can you do a let's encrypt cert on your uh, on a domain there? I don't see why not. So I mean, there's I mean that's something new for me. You can do that. You can create PGP keys. I mean, you can do a whole course. Obviously, obviously they have this already with the Raspberry Pi. But one of my friends said I got I got a Raspberry Pi for my like five my my twelve year old, and I said this would be a perfect project because it benefits everyone. It's not like oh it, it does this little tiny thing. It just it just this is something everyone can use. Everyone in the family, anywhere you're at, you can now be secure. So. Yeah, it's it's really cool and useful, and it gives them something to, you know, talk about and talk to their kids about. And and I mean, I just it's I'm just looking for. I I did ask Tom if I should uh, create a Tor endnode, and I think we said no, <laughs> no. definitely not. <laughs> I I love the Tor project, but uh, you know. Uh, standing up your own node at your place of business, uh, unless you own said place of business, literally like you own it, um, it your work is not a place to set up a Tor endpoint. Um, for for as great as Tor is, you know it's used for great things. It's used to protect journalists. It's used to help uh, citizens in uh, you know oppressive regimes get out to the free and open internet and get real information. Uh, it, it's used to you know protect people who are uh, being abused or being spied on um, from governments or people. Uh, it has a lot of great uses, but you know, like any tool, it can be used for ill as well. And there's a lot of really bad things that go on in the Tor network. So you don't want that. Uh, you don't want that traffic going out your workplace endpoint because it, if someone sees it, and chances are, if you've got any IT at all. Uh, someone will see it, or in, in the worst of case, the cops will come to your place of business and say, hey, did you upload all of this illegal content to this web server? Uh, no, but I have a Tor end node. You'll probably get fired. Yeah. Uh, right. So if, if you own your place of business, by all means, stand one up. Just understand what you're getting into. You're helping people in the best ways, uh, but you're – also going to get the dregs of the internet. It, it, again, these are just ideas that I'm running through. Nothing. Obviously, any idea I do, I will run through my IT director, which is always the good thing. If uh, if you run a library, uh, and I know librarians are all about freedom of, freedom of information, freedom of speech, uh, and protecting the sanctity of free information, then uh, please run a Tor node because the Tor project needs you. Uh, and if you don't want to run a node, if you're not in a position where you can do that, but you've got some spare money, the Tor project is having a great donation drive, so toss some money their way. Uh, they are very important for internet freedom, and this is the first time they've ever asked for any funding from the public. Uh, it's a great project, and yeah, you know, have at it. Toss them a few bucks. I think I, I think I definitely want to look into all the security aspects you can do with a Raspberry Pi, and and go from there. My mining Bitcoin idea on a Raspberry Pi seemed to fall flat on its face. <laughs> I don't think you would. Yeah, have that's it's probably not going to work very well. So, uh, you you can make a Tor hidden service, so you could run web pages in Tor on a Raspberry Pi. There you go, and because I I got this idea because you told me to run Orbot and how you can throw everything into it, and it's like instead of creating yep. um, a VPN uh, to get to access sites that are blocked by organizations, I can just create a Tor node and it would do the same. Not create a Tor node, but use Tor to do it that way. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. But like yeah. I said, creating the VPN server on a Raspberry Pi, excellent project. It doesn't take that long. It's not that hard. And you learn so much about security and how difficult it really is. So Yeah. And, you know, just, just for our listeners, if, if you're out there, you're thinking, ah, I probably should use a VPN. I don't want to toss any money at security. I don't want to you know, pay a VPN provider, and I don't even know what I'm buying, and are the apps any good? You know, there's a lot of questions there. Um, there's a free program. You can get it on the Google Play Store or F-Droid if you want to go for the open source store um, called Orbot, O-R-B-O-T. Uh, what it is, is it's actually Tor for Android. Uh, now they've got this great little button that says apps. You hit it, 
and uh, it sets VPN mode on your phone. So all of the traffic is now being routed through the VPN. Uh, that VPN being the Tor network. You don't have to pay a dime for it, but now all of your traffic is being routed through Tor. You can use insecure Wi-Fi, uh, load up Orbot, and everything is running through Tor. It's going to be protected, and people can't sniff your traffic. Now, there are other you know nastier issues with um, open Wi-Fi, but if you need, you know, I don't want to call it the poor man's VPN because Tor rocks, but if you need a free VPN that I know a lot of people ask for, uh, Orbot is great for mobile. And uh, if you're getting throttled by your wireless carrier based on certain types of traffic, uh, yeah, the Orbot will help you there. Well, and the last few minutes, I wanted to talk about, we, we were going to talk about resolutions at some point, just different things that we wanted to do. And being the end of the year, this is the time where obviously you get a fresh start. And, and one of those things is obviously change your passwords. If you haven't done that, change your, your master passwords. And I guess the new thing is maybe try one new security thing that you haven't done yet. Try to get one friend to use an encrypted messaging platform and see if you can pick up something like that or learn how to do PGP, uh, send an encrypted email. If you haven't done that yet, which is not as easy as you think, but it's definitely doable. And once you get it, you're going to be, if you're in a position, you can always market yourself as you know how to do this. You can be that secure person on your team. Or, uh, you know, uh, download the Tor browser, just, just see how, uh, the anonymity network works for you. Uh, cause it's, you know, it's actually not any different than the normal internet other than you can get to dot onion sites, most of which aren't worth going to. Um, but it's, it's great to bypass filters and, you know, it, it's just a little piece of knowledge you can carry, uh, carry around with you. Um, you know, I, I know I'm going to, I'm going to try to use signal more, uh, as, as the year goes on. I, I think that's, that was awesome. Uh, what we've done. Yeah. So if you want to, I, I, I haven't actually asked Tom yet. So this is live on air question if you want to we create a security questions chat if you want to find us we're not that hard to find and we will add you to our chat and then you can ask your security questions and it's all encrypted and everything else i think i'm hoping you're okay with that oh absolutely yeah that that's great so so we had a listener uh ask us a couple questions uh, about security topics and what do you think about this? Is this tool good? What do I do in this situation? You know, just pretty pretty general stuff, but good questions. Uh, if you've got questions, if you want a direct line to us, uh, we've got an encrypted group chat on Signal. Uh, you know, either send us an email, get in contact with us somehow, and we'll get you. Uh, you know, we'll we'll trade Signal information, get you added to this group, uh, and then we can have you know conversations about security and security topics. Uh, because, you know, I feel like I've helped uh, even even a little bit by answering some questions and it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like a smart person. Uh, so I absolutely love the idea of getting more people into this chat. And the desktop client, I think they've pretty much fixed their problems. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we had some major problems, uh, I don't know, six weeks ago. And now it's I'm not getting the double messages. I'm not getting this. Sometimes something is delayed. Like I'll get it on my phone first. Or I'll have to relaunch uh, Signal and everything else. But for the most part, it's good, which uh, ticks off one of my requirements for a messaging platform, that it be cross-platform and you don't get duplicate messages. So Signal has definitely done that. And while it's not as uh, as easy to use or as pretty as, let's say, Telegram, you know that the that it's very, very secure. Yeah. And you know, just, just to mention again, um, you know, Telegram got dinged again recently in the news because another cryptographer looked at it and they said, yeah, this stuff is totally broken. They wrote their own encryption and it was awful. End of story. Telegram is broken. Do not use it. Get people off of it. Well, the, 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 the funny part is my, my question. Well, so if you're trying to hide from your mother or from your neighbor or from the business, whatever, I'm sure Telegram is okay, but at that point, if you're going that far to hide from people, why not just take the next step? I mean, Signal is not that ugly. It's not that unuser friendly. It's way better than a lot of other stuff. And I think we were talking, this is probably the way to go. For You can't do encryption via email because it's too hard for most people. So here's a way. Email is pretty much dying when you want to get information. So here, here, here you go. And if, you're, and if you really need to send information, 
then you uh, fall back to PGP. But what I loved about Signal is you couldn't screenshot. So I tried screenshotting. It wouldn't let me. I tried to do now on tap, which is a, a feature in uh, Android that, that gives you contextual stuff. It disabled that. I couldn't do that. There was no way unless I took a photo of my phone to send that out. Yeah, it's it's pretty locked down. Now, if you had a uh, a rooted phone and a rooted screenshot uh, application, yes, that could get through it because it's got root access to the display driver. It can grab the entire screen. Uh, but through normal methods, you can't really get information out of Signal, uh, which is fantastic. It's exactly uh, it's operating as designed. So I think on my resolutions uh, for for the new year, that's going to be on there. Uh, another thing that I'd like to try to do, although I've heard, you know, it's just kind of a pain and not worth it. Uh, I'd like to see if, uh, I'm not going to commit to doing this, but I'd like to see if it's even feasible to move away from Gmail. I love Gmail. I love the spam protection. I love the organization. I love how it just works everywhere all the time. But there's something about controlling my own mail server that's really appealing. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see where that goes. I wish you the best of luck on that. I mean, I'm still at yeah. Gmail. It's it's rolling. While people can roll their own server, I feel like Gmail has has figured it out in the years that it's done. And you know what? If I want to send you a secure message, we'll definitely find other ways to do it. But you know what? You may be right. Maybe you're you're almost all of it gone with own cloud and everything open source. Maybe th this is probably the final last step. Yeah, and you know, I I might be moving away from own cloud, but I'm still in testing. Sync thing is really cool. I, yeah, well, that was another one. But at least, and then we can ask you next year at the very end and say how how is this all open source thing working for you? And do we real? And is it just is it just an exercise in frustration, or is this the way of the future? Yeah, and you know, if if you're an uh, an old hand LastPass user, if you've been on it for a while, and you're like, oh yeah, LastPass, I use that. That's easy. If you're used to the password manager idea and it's not brand new to you, uh, you know, think about think about the new year. Just try it out. Not not totally converting. Try out KeePass. Try out KeePass. Uh, you know, it, encrypt the the file, throw it somewhere, synchronize it, uh, and see if you can go the fully open source route. Uh, actually, here's a great idea. Um, try Linux. You know, go go find a uh, Linux Mint Live CD or an Ubuntu Live CD. Uh, they're both great, easy to use operating systems. Put it in your computer, boot from the CD. If you hate it, just reboot, take the disk out and everything's back to normal. You haven't actually erased or installed anything. Uh, so try out Ubuntu, try out Linux Mint, just try a Linux of some kind because uh, you might like it and it is way more secure look i've been i've been praising chrome os as as here is something for most people to get most of their jobs done and yes while it's google and everything else and I, was it chromium chromium is the i can't remember the back end of linux that it's using but anyway gen 2 is it gen 2 okay it's gen 2 on the back end which is kind of crazy you don't really see things built on gen 2 but the idea is that it does it does all, all the automatic updates and everything else but it it is not it's not windows and it's not os 10 so when people say oh i have to have windows ask yourself do you really have to have windows do you really want to be there with microsoft automatically updating and everything else or do you want to try something else and buying a hundred and fifty dollar Chromebook and playing around with it is another awesome, awesome like father son type thing that you can do on a weekend and learn all these different things on how to install Crouton and and run all these different services right through it. And you know, most of the time when someone says, "Oh, I have to have Windows," what they're actually saying is, "I would like a word processor of some kind." Also, I need to get to Facebook. Right, you can do all of that with a Chromebook. Look, the only thing you can't do on a Chromebook, and it's going to be four years of computer of a computer science degree to understand, is run Skype. I think that's the only yeah. negative is run Skype, yep. and that's because it's an instruction set that Intel that Skype built for Intel and not for ARM, and it's really that simple. And there's Microsoft has no reason to to bless uh, Chrome OS with it, so that's one thing iTunes would be a second thing, but you're doing cloud services now. So at that point, I don't know. 
I'm trying to think of anything else. Lightroom, if you're managing photos, but I think that's it. Yeah, that's that's really about it. I would say Photoshop, Lightroom. If you absolutely desperately need Microsoft Office for something, uh, and you can't get away, well, actually, you could. You could get away with an Office 365 account. So even if you do need Office on the Chromebook, Office 365 works perfectly. Uh, you know, go get a subscription because you're going to need one anyway if you want the new software, and deal with it and <laughs> use it on the Chromebook. It's great. So. Okay, at that point, we're time's, time's up, so we will see you next year. We should still be recording fairly weekly, just last week and this week are a little crazy, but we'll obviously we'll continue recording. Anyway, we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. See ya.